I, I really do appreciate that uh, you're in the practice of standing for the reading of God's word. I think it's, it's an honorable thing and respectful, but I'm just going to let you wave that tonight unless you feel obligated, all right? If you want to if you want to follow along and keep if you've got let's see you got five fingers you may have a hard time keeping all these places but we'll come back to them I'm going to read just parts out of these six verses tonight uh, to get started all right Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 says for I would not brethren that ye should be ignorant And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. And 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. Brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And then Peter joined in the uh, chorus in 2 Peter 3.8. But beloved, be not ignorant. So I'm going to preach tonight about stamp out ignorance. Amen. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Now there's people wanting to stamp out hunger and stamp out poverty. And so we probably should stamp out ignorance. What do you think? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Pray you'd. Anoint in the preaching of your word, speak to our hearts and bring us, Lord, to understanding and knowledge of your word, because your word did say that there are those that are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I pray you'd help us tonight to gain insight from your word, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. My mind was drawn to this phrase from from probably the most familiar uh, use of that phrase in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll get to that later. But I just became curious as to how many times that word ignorant was used in the New Testament. What I found was those those six, they almost sound exactly the same. And there's a couple other times it's used in a little bit different way. But I begin to I begin to think about that. It's pretty obvious there are some things that God doesn't want us to be ignorant about. Amen. And and the word ignorant there is is really not a it's not a derogatory word. It's not calling somebody an idiot or an imbecile. But the word as it's used in, in every one of these phrases about be not ignorant or that you should not be ignorant. It means to be unaware and without understanding. Not to get a grasp on what God wants to say. And what I found in all six of these places, there is something God wants us to understand. We're going to take a look at them tonight. And if you don't know anything else, you probably you already do know something about the Bible. But if you don't know anything else, at least you'll know the things you're not supposed to be ignorant about. Amen. So I'm going to help you out tonight, all right? Amen. The first one deals with God's purpose for the Gentiles. In in Romans 11, 25, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Paul writes that we should be aware of the fact that Israel was God's original chosen people. And, and they have not forever lost that privilege. Right. Now, we're living in a day, and I know, you, you know there a lot of people, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't hear a lot of radio or TV preachers, and we don't read a lot of their stuff. I, I don't, honestly, I don't. Most of the reading I do is from older stuff, you know, because, well, I just, it's got more to it than most of the new. But there are a number of, of people today in the, in the uh, charismatic movement and even in, in denominational movements that are saying that Israel has been forever pushed aside, that they will never again be God's people, that now the church has supl- replaced Israel and taken their place fully in the end time. And that is not so. And, and Paul said we should not be ignorant about this principle. Amen. What's happened right now is only a temporary arrangement. Amen. Amen. Israel is not forever rejected. Yes, they did reject the Messiah. And blindness has come over their minds and their hearts for this time. And Paul described it like this in Romans. If you read other places there earlier on. That there was a tree whose natural branches withered and were cut off and then these other branches that were wild branches were grafted in that original tree and and it was Israel was represented by those
those original branches and they've been cut off and set aside. And the Gentiles have been grafted in. But now God's purpose for the Gentiles is being realized. Amen. Salvation is being offered to everybody in the world. Amen. Those among the Gentile nations, God's grace has appeared to all men. And God commands all men everywhere to repent. But we've got to understand something more about this matter. Not only has Israel been blinded and put away, and the Gentiles drawn near and grafted in, but Israel will once again be restored and redeemed. Amen. Grafted back into the tree of God's purpose and plan. Hallelujah. Amen. Matter of fact, and some, someday I'll, I'll probably preach to you what I preached at that prophecy conference, but it had to do in, in all about this subject, really, Amen. That Israel has been set aside, but only temporarily. And Paul declares in the very next verse, after the text I read, So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. So we can rejoice in God's purpose for the Gentiles in that we have been saved. But we must not become careless, amen, or take this opportunity lightly because it will not last forever. Amen. The day is coming when God will cease His work with the Gentiles as we know it and will again turn His favor to Israel and work with Israel so that they will be saved. So we need to be careful about how we live for God and not lose the opportunity that we have been given. So don't be ignorant about that, all right? Amen. How many of you think you understand God's purpose for the Gentiles? You understand that, okay? Nobody does? Anybody understand okay? Three of you do? Maybe I better preach for longer. You just don't want to, how many just don't want to raise your hand? Two of you didn't, okay. This is really good. We're getting great response right here. Good thing we're not videoing this for TV, you know what? Amen. Secondly, we're told about God's pattern in Israel's experiences. We're not to be ignorant about that. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were over thrown in the wilderness so when we read these old testament accounts and the old testament record about israel's failures and sins we need to understand something don't be ignorant about this all right these experiences that israel had are examples and lessons for us you know you say well that's so elementary we know that but you know the church world at large has pretty well taken the old testament and kicked it out They've just disregarded it, they disrespect it, and they put it out, and it's not even really in use for the most part. Matter of fact, a lot of churches don't even use an Old Testament. All they have is a New Testament and maybe a few of the Psalms. But the Bible said that we should not be ignorant that all that happened to Israel were lessons for us. And the things he specifically talks about here was the fact that all of them had the same great spiritual blessings. But many of them were overcome by temptation and sin, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. Some of them lusted after evil things, and they were punished for it. And if you and I lust after evil things, we'll also be punished for it. Amen. Some of them practiced idolatry and they were slain for it. And if you and I are caught up in the world of materialism and practice idolatry, we will suffer for it too. Amen. Some of them committed fornication and God sent plagues on them. And that happens today already. Amen. There are people that are already suffering physical plagues of disease because of their immorality. And if we fall to that, it will happen to us too. Amen. Some tempted God and God sent those fiery serpents to bite them. Amen. If you think you're bigger than God and you tempt God, you'll find out you're in big trouble. Amen. Some of them murmured and complained and they were destroyed. So, hey, don't be ignorant about these things. He finishes that passage with the verse that says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
Now he takes all those Old Testament lessons and moves them right into our day-to-day and says to us, hey, look what happened to Israel. Look what happened to those people that had God's blessing, but they didn't follow through in obedience. Be careful, that same thing can happen to you. Not be ignorant about that. You understand Israel's trouble and how we learn from that? I'm doing better, praise the Lord. Amen. Third, God's provision of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12.1, now... Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. you got to wonder if, if in our day, in a lot of our own holiness Pentecostal churches, if Paul wouldn't have trouble because so many of us are ignorant about the spiritual gifts, huh? Amen. Paul dedicates two entire chapters in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, to discuss the importance of and the operation of these gifts of the Spirit. And I'm not, obviously I can't preach a whole message on it. I did back around Christmas time and covered them in some detail. But there are three gifts that are gifts to know. They're, they're God-giving knowledge to men, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits. And there are three gifts of action, of faith, healings and miracles and three gifts of speaking prophecy tongues and interpretation of tongues amen and we're told not to be ignorant about these gifts we need to understand and study what the bible says about them they are given by the holy ghost to spirit filled believers amen they're for the purpose of edifying the church of giving exhortation and warning and comfort there is a sign to unbelievers that god's power and the power of the holy ghost is genuine amen for souls to be saved for saints to be encouraged and perfected amen we're not only to know about these gifts we're supposed to understand them and paul said desire them we're to have a hunger a coveting spirit in regard to these gifts amen and toward the end of that discussion of gifts paul said in chapter 14 but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, if you don't want to learn about it, so be it. If you want to go through your Christian life ignorant about the gifts of the Spirit, that's your choice, so be it. But that's not what God wants. Amen. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about those things. And we are a Pentecostal church. Amen. We ought to, we ought to believe in and we ought to pray for and we ought to expect and anticipate, amen, the working of the gifts of the Spirit right in our own services. Amen. Number four, God's power to deliver is something we're not to be ignorant of. For we would not, brethren, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust he will yet deliver us. We have to understand as a people of God and children of God and saints of God that we are not exempt from trouble. Amen. Sometimes we act like we're ignorant of the fact that even though we're Christians, we're going to have some trouble. Don't be ignorant about that. We're going to have some trouble. Amen. Paul said we were pressed out of measure. To me, that says we were under pressure more than what we thought was necessary. Out of measure. Seems like he's saying, hey, I was getting more than what I thought I ought to be getting. So I, I was suffering more than I thought was necessary. You know what? So do we. Oh, yes, amen. And then he said, not only pressed out of measure, but pressed above strength. We were pressed more than we even thought we could stand, more than we thought we were able to bear. We've oftentimes gone back to that verse where God said he wouldn't put on us more than we could bear, and we made it sound like God had, had broken his word and was not doing right when the fact of the matter was we were ignorant about how much we could bear. And it got so bad, Paul said they even despaired of life. That's pretty bad. But, he said, amen, we as the children of God, we've already died to the flesh. You know, we got to, this is a hard lesson for us to learn. Amen. But we, we as children of God are supposed to have already died to the flesh. Died to self-will, died to self-comfort, amen, not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in God. 
Amen. And if you and I genuinely have died out to self and died out to self-will and died out to self-comfort, amen, then even when trouble comes, man, we don't get angry, we don't get bitter, amen, we don't begin arguing with God and, and getting angry at God because we've already given ourselves up. When you and I have honestly given ourselves up to God and given Him total control, He can do whatever He wants. When you argue with Him, then you don't have full control. He used the idea about the potter, remember, and the clay. And He said to Israel, hey, I'm the potter, you're the clay. Can't I make you what I want? Why? Why should the clay say back to the potter, why have you made me thus? If you really put yourself in his hands, Paul said, amen, you have died already. The sentence of death has already come into yourself, so you don't trust yourself, but you trust God. And that's a good thing. Amen, because we're trusting in a God who has already delivered us from sin and therefore from hell. And we're trusting in a God, amen, who delivers us every day. Sometimes we're aware of it and sometimes we're not aware of it till later. And sometimes we're not aware of it at all. Amen, but he's delivering us every day. And he will yet Deliver us, not only in the troubles of earthly life, amen, but from this world of trouble, he'll deliver us completely at his coming. Amen. We can't be ignorant about the fact that God has power to deliver. Hallelujah. Amen. Number five. I only got one more. That's pretty good, isn't it, after number five? We are not to be ignorant of God's plan of rapture and resurrection. And that's the verse that started me off on this search. It's the most familiar one of them all. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming. Amen. God does not want us to be ignorant of the fact that Jesus is coming. He will come in the clouds, in the air. Amen. The dead in Christ will rise first. All living believers will be raptured, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. Now, I know we sometimes get crossed about this. It's hard to fully understand. How? How can that happen? I don't know. When is it going to happen? I don't know. But the how and the when are not the problem. The how and the when are God's problem, not ours. We're supposed to believe. Amen. You know, and it's not really too hard to understand. It's already happened on a lesser scale. Enoch has already been translated to heaven. Do you believe that really happened, Enoch? How did it happen? I don't know. It just happened. Did it really happen? Yeah, it did. Elijah's already been taken to heaven. Did it happen or not? Yes, it did. Can it happen? Well, sure it can. It already has. Jesus has already been taken up to heaven, hadn't he? His disciples watched him go. So, I mean, already, in, in, it's already happened. It's going to happen again on a larger scale. Are you ready for it? Are you waiting for it? Are you watching for it? Amen. God's plan of rapture and revelation is something that we should not be ignorant of. Amen. Oftentimes, we've... Uh, for lack of a better word, argued, maybe, maybe disagreed is a better word. We've disagreed so much about the timing of the rapture that we've neglected the truth of the rapture. But we're not to be ignorant about it. The Lord is going to come. Amen. And finally, number six, we're not to be ignorant of God's perspective of time. Amen. Beloved, Peter said, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. You know, a lot, a lot of our frustration and a lot of our worry and a lot of our stress could all be removed if we'd just not be ignorant about this principle. 
God has a completely different perspective of time. Amen. That's right. You know, it's interesting. People move from bigger cities. They move down. And even, you know, Oklahoma City was not one of the major cities in America, really, as far as population. But, man, life was a whole lot more fast-paced there than it is here. When people move from an area like that to here in West Plains around these Ozarks, and you talk to them, they say, man, I like this, this slower pace of life. You know, we're on a different time schedule. Now, I know we feel busy, you know, and, and maybe we're catching up to some degree. <laughs> Seems like to me there's more and more and more traffic in West Plains. You can't hardly get around. But, I mean, for the most part, it's still we're on a different time schedule than some of those other places are. And we need to understand that God is on a different time schedule than we're on. Amen. Peter already in that chapter discussed scoffers and mockers who are denying the rapture, denying the resurrection, denying the end of the world as we know it. And these mockers are saying things like this. Well, nothing's changed. Things are like they've always been, you know. And time's just plodding on. It's all keep going, been going on, been going on. It's always going to be going on. And Peter says, hey, wait a minute. Hold on. God does not count time like you and I do. Yeah, we can sit here today and say, oh, they've been talking about that for a long, for years, for years, long time, coming to the Lord, into the world, all those kind of things, and, and nothing's happened. But hold on, he said, one day of his is like a thousand years to us. A thousand years. You can't, we can't even hardly comprehend a thousand years. We get, we get befuddled thinking of a hundred or two hundred years ago. I mean, America's only been a nation for, what, 230-some years? That seems like ancient history. Think about a 1,000 years. Take us from 2009, you know, all the way back to 1009. Who in the world knows what was happening in 1009? I don't even know. Martin Luther, the reformer, hadn't even been born, wasn't even living yet in 1009. Columbus hadn't even discovered America yet in 1009. I mean, he still had 400 years to wait, 400 more. Come on, think how much a 1,000 years in our time is. And God in heaven, amen, who's not on our calendar and not on our clock system, and he doesn't have daylight savings time, amen, or any other kind of time in that regard, a 1,000 years go by down here, and to God it's like one day passing by. Amen, we get so bogged down, amen, because we don't understand the time difference. Amen. Heaven is on a completely different time zone. It's difficult enough to call somebody in California. Three hours difference. Remembering the time change, you know? And you try to call someone in Japan or in Germany or wherever it might be around the world. It's an amazing time change or London. Amen. But from here to heaven is an amazing time change. Just, just be patient. Oh, I know time seems to be marching on as it always has, but don't be fooled by that. Amen. There really is a purpose for the delay it, that's happened in fulfilling all these end-time prophecies. Peter said, calm down, be patient, just wait, because there's a reason. The Lord is long-suffering, and he's not willing that anyone should perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance, and to him it's just another day. How about the old song that's been sung in the past for years? Wait a little longer, please, Jesus. If he waits one day, we're going to be here for a long time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, I know, I know, I don't think we've got another thousand years by any means coming on the earth. I understand all that. I'm just saying, just, just settle down. Amen. Realize that time here is not time there. God will work all of his plans and all of his purpose, but he has a completely different perspective of time. Yes, the day of the Lord will come. Amen. Don't be uninformed about it. Don't be deceived about it. Don't become apathetic and unconcerned about it. And don't lose hope. Amen. Jesus really will come, and his plan and his purpose will be fulfilled. So what do we do until then? Well, like we sing, let's hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen. When the hours pass and the days pass and the weeks pass and the months and the years, we count them off and mark them off and mark them off. Just keep holding to his hand. It's unchanging. 
Amen. He has a totally different perspective than you and I do. Amen. So we're going to work to stamp out some ignorance. What do you say? Amen. Praise the Lord. The more we know about God's word, the more faith we'll have. Even in troublesome times, like Brother Mark said, amen, we're living in uncertain times, but we still have a certain God. Let's stand tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, let's thank God tonight for the truth of his word, that he hasn't left us ignorant, but he's given us the revelation that we need in order to understand him and his will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your care for us. Oh, Lord, help us to take your word seriously, not only to read it recreationally, Lord, but to read it for the, the meat that we need in our soul. Oh, Lord, our faith must grow, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, help us right here at Junction Hill not to be ignorant of your word, but, oh, to have an understanding, Lord. It goes not only from our head, but all the way to our heart and out into our life. Praise your name, Lord. Oh, give us grace, Lord, and understanding in these last days. And as we wait and watch for you.